This is Join Us in France, episode 361, 361. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France. Great places to visit in France, French culture, history, gastronomy, and news related to travel during the pandemic. Ah, will it ever end? Today, I bring you a conversation with Brianne Cunningham about her anniversary trip to Paris and Provence. Brianne and her husband were were in Paris for four days and then took the TGV to Provence for six days in July 2021. They had a great time and she shares the best of her trip, including specific recommendations of where to go, stay and eat. Plus, she was a lot of fun to talk to. Can I just say how I love doing itinerary reviews again? Keep them coming. And this week, I introduce you to a new regular segment of the podcast, the French expression of the week. This week, the expression is Je donne ma langue au chat. Do you know this one? I'll explain after my chat with Brianne. After the interview, I'll also share some of the things that have happened this week for the podcast and in France, but I'll keep it short because I need to get out the door to discover Périgueux in the Dordogne. If you like what we do here at Join Us in France, consider supporting us by visiting joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique to check out my cookbook, Join Us at the Table, my Paris tours on the Voice Map app. And by the way, podcast listeners get a discount if they buy from the boutique instead of buying from the app. And my very popular uh, itinerary review service where I help you craft the best vacation in France specifically for you. The itinerary reviews will be taking a break for the winter. So if the page is gone, that's why. Follow Addicted to France on Instagram to see Brianne's lovely photos of her trip. I'll post them this week. And the best way to stay in touch with me and with everything you need to know about travel to France is to sign up for the newsletter at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. Bonjour, Brianne Cunningham, and welcome to join us in France. Bonjour, Annie. Now tell me, when did you have your trip to France, your latest one anyway? We traveled. We were actually supposed to travel at the end of May and realized that that probably wasn't going to work out. So we pushed back as late as we could and ended up traveling July 14th until July 24th. Okay. So, like, had, did you need to cancel everything and rebook everything? With the help of our, we had a smart flyer travel agent, um, Corey. She was able to um, just get everything moved to a later date. It did affect the Airbnb that we were staying in. It was course, no longer yeah. available, but everything else um, just transferred and everyone was wonderful about it. And actually, um, I was worried about the cost of things going up because it would be more like high season there, um, summer rates. Um, but actually, both hotels that we were planning to stay in were offering discounts um, at that later date. So it worked out really well. Right, because this year, a lot of places were not quite full. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And so this, you traveled with your husband and this was yes. your first trip to France. Yes, both of, and it was actually both of our first trips to Europe um, as well. We were traveling to celebrate my 40th birthday, which would have been at the end of May, um, and actually ended up when we rescheduled being there on our 15th wedding anniversary. So it was kind of a combo trip. Great, a wedding anniversary. Fantastic. Yes. So you also have a fun blog that I looked at, and it has a lot of stuff. Um, how do you say <laughs> it? So Brienne, or how do you say that? So it's XO Brienne, um, dot com. Oh, and, XO, um, like hugs XO and kisses. XO is in 
Exactly. Exactly. Oh, yes. I'm slow. Um, <laughs> so it's no, <laughs> it's kind of, um, you know, it, I guess it would be a lifestyle blog. Um, but I love to, I'm a teacher, I'm an elementary teacher, but I'm also a design and travel lover. Um, so it has a little bit of everything to yeah. design in my home and, um, any trips that we take, I blog about even recipes and, um, that kind of thing. Cool. Cool. Okay. There will be a link in the show notes for her blog. Okay. So uh, how did you use the podcast to prepare for your trip? And then tell us about your, your trip. Okay. So I actually don't remember how I discovered um, your podcast, but it was just after the new year. Um, and I, you know, the trip was well planned at that point and I just became obsessed <laughs> and started, <laughs> I subscribed and I just, there were so many episodes. I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to get through all of these before our trip. Um, but I just started scrolling and anything I saw that I thought might pertain to our travel. I listened to on my way to and from work doing laundry. And it was so, so helpful, especially the episode you did with your husband about driving in for France. Yeah. Um, it was long, but it was so helpful. I was so grateful to have found that one. Um, the Paris flea market episode and um, just especially all the Paris episodes about the museums and, and foods um, were oh, good. just, I was taking notes everywhere. Um, so we, we started with Paris. And we flew into CDG early in the morning and, and our independent travel agent, Corey, had arranged for a driver to take us straight to our hotel. Too early to check in, but we were able to store our bags there and then headed right out and spent four days in Paris before taking a TGV, which was an experience, <laughs> to Avignon, I believe is how you say it. Yeah. Um, we got there and picked up a rental car and then the Riviera as well. So we were in Provence for three days and the Riviera for two days before flying out of Nice. Okay, so you said taking the TGV was an experience. Tell us yes. more. Yes. <laughs> um, well, our driver had been, we had, we actually just took a taxi from our hotel in Paris and she was very helpful about, and so was the hotel about, you know, go in this terminal and go straight here and look at the screens. Um, but somehow there was a miscommunication and we ended up in the opposite terminal of what we were supposed to be in. And it was very crowded. A lot of people, which we hadn't really experienced a lot of crowds in Paris, but so just trying to figure out exactly where to be and what, where to, when you walk down the to the platform, I guess, um, where exactly we needed to be and get on. We tried to get on in one area and it was come to find out it was wrong. So we had to pull off all of our luggage <laughs> um, oh. and, and have someone help us to find the correct area. Once we got on, it was great, but, it took um, a while. but we were a little, it, it did. And so we were glad we got there early. Um, but it was, um, and you had, left had first, from which train station in Paris? Um, we were, oh, Gare de l'Est, I assume. Yes, yes, that was that's correct, and and it was a great experience. It was very nice and clean, and um, we were in first class seats. I'm not sure what the difference would have been between, um, but we had plenty of room and. My husband napped and I just kind of enjoyed the scenery and using the app to track where we were as we traveled. So, <laughs> Yeah, the TGV is fun, but it is true that if you've never been in a big train station in France, it's yes. going to feel a little bit like, whoa, what's this? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm a planner, so I like to know exactly what to do. So it caught me a little off guard. But, right. So um, for anybody listening who isn't sure, really the best way to do this is to arrive at the train station one hour before you're, you're scheduled to leave. That should give you plenty of time to find the right platform and all that. And that applies to big train stations in Paris or any other big city. If you're taking a train in a minor train station, the choices are much narrower and it take, doesn't take okay. as long to find it, you know? Yes, yes, that makes sense. Right. Okay, so then you settled in Saint-Rémy-de-Provence for a few days. Yes. And you had we a car. We stayed there. We did. We had a car um, and we stayed at Le Saint-Rémy which was beautiful. I wish we would have 
had more time to explore that actual town that we stayed in, but it felt like we got up early each day and ventured out in the car and got back in the evening and, you know, most things were closed. They did have some type of market while we were there a couple of different nights, actually, and we got to peek at that. Um, But it was a a really cute, cute town, and I I felt like it was a great home base. I was glad that we chose it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a problem in Provence. Where where do you, you know, it's really difficult to find one place to stay for two weeks or whatever, because you're going to end up, it's kind of a big area, and so you need to move around a little bit anyway, I think. Yes. So, and we were just there for a few days, so, but we were able to get out and see, you know, my husband was our driver and he was a little nervous about driving there, even though they drive on the same side of the road as us, it was very different. Um, I, I had prepared him for all of the roundabouts (laughs) thanks to the (laughs) podcast episode. And, um, we knew what most of the signs said, but a lot of times we were driving, the roads were very narrow and, you all had talked about, you know, there being just kind of drop offs on the side, almost like ditches and not a lot of shoulders. Oh, and yeah, yeah. So starting out, I'm not sure he was the most confident, but we got better and you just there's no way to figure it out. It, you just have to kind of jump in and but got better as the trip went on and kind of figured out parking. We realized that sometimes when I had things pulled up on GPS, it was taking us to the city center in a roundabout way and not taking us. Um, straight to the parking area for for the different small towns like ah, Gord. Yes. And, um, so we figured that out pretty quickly and that helped. And um, we knew what to look for to pay for parking, thanks to your episodes. And just really, I mean, we, we aren't big. I should say I am not one that just loves to relax on vacation. I want to see all of the things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wasn't sure when we would be back to France. So there wasn't a lot of relaxing. We were maximizing our time there and seeing every possible thing that we could. So we Mm -hmm. actually hit, um, I think, you know, a dozen different towns and cities throughout our 11 days there, over a dozen. Wow. So it was amazing. Wow. Yeah. So direct, I mean, pretty much you landed in Paris, had what, one night in Paris? We actually had four days in Paris. So that was where we were the longest. And then you went south. Yes, exactly. Okay, then and we then you went the back to Paris for the end of the trip. Well, we went. We ended up in Nice um, in the Riviera, and we flew out of Nice, but we did have a layover in Paris. We didn't do anything there, um, just stayed at the airport before ah, okay. flying back to the States. Okay. So it was four days in Paris, three days in the, in the Provence area, um, and two days in the Riviera. Yeah, that's... So Paris was... It was it was quick. <laughs> right. Um, I wish we wish we could have been there longer, but we had young kiddos at home that and my husband couldn't be gone from work much longer. So 11 days was about the max we could do for this trip. Right. So with, you know, having done this, would you say maybe you should have chosen either Paris or Provence? It's both funny was you too ask much? that. I mean, I, I think I don't have any regrets about the way we did it. And I think I would do it the exact same way again. Um, I loved, we, I mean, were we exhausted by the end? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But like I said, I'm not sure we saved for this trip for a while. Um, and we have very busy children and I'm not sure when we'll get to do this again. So right. I really was grateful to get to see all areas of France. Um, I took four years of French in high school and that was kind of when I fell in love with the idea of traveling to Paris. And so that was what I had always visualized, but I would have regretted the opportunity, um, missing the opportunity of seeing Provence because mm-hmm. I absolutely fell in love with that area. Mm -hmm. I, the Riviera was beautiful, but if maybe if I were to make a change next time, I may nix the Riviera and spend more time in Provence. I was glad we got to see it. And I definitely had some favorite areas there like Ease and Antibes. Um, But I, I was, I'm very grateful that we were able to, to do both even in a short period of time like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the TGV was very helpful and allowing us to be able to do that. But we just, we go, go, go. You do, yes. <laughs> um, so we, we get up early and we would get back to our hotel or Airbnb pretty late. But 
um, were able to, I just was able to see so much. And now I just want to go back so soon. And like I said, um, I would love to spend more time in Provence. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And we saw so many villages there just driving around and having the freedom of having a car yes. um, was one wonderful for us because I think some places we thought we'd want to spend more time in and we didn't. And then other places that we thought would be quick stops, we ended up staying longer right. um, than we anticipated. So I love, I, I was so glad that we had rented yeah. a car and yeah, and we're trying to do buses. It's very interesting how when you're visiting Provence and the difference between Provence and the Riviera is that Provence is inland and the Riviera yes. is beachfront, pretty much. Now, when you're right. in Provence, you really need a car because it's hard to get around all these little towns. It's way, way right. better if you have a car. Whereas where on the Riviera, you really do not want a car. You want to just drop it off and use public transportation because it's just too difficult to park everywhere you want to go. Right, right. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back and talk about the days you had in Paris and what you did there. Okay. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> like I said, we crammed a lot in. We, My husband is a trooper, and he knew that there were um, several museums that I really wanted to see. And he appreciates art, but um, doesn't doesn't love I actually have um, an elementary education degree but also a certificate in art so I can teach art um, mm. to elementary kiddos anyway um, so you so wanted he to see was fine stuff. with that I, I wanted to see things that yeah that I had studied and learned about in art history and only seen pictures of so yeah um, we we our hotel Relais Christine was in the sixth and I think it was the Saint Germain neighborhood so mm -hmm. We loved that location. We got to, I think our first stop that we made was actually a museum and we went to the Orsay, um, in the, in the rail, old rail station. Yeah. Um, and I had listened to that episode and at, that was his, out of all the museums we did, that was actually ended up being his favorite. Mm -hmm. Um, so that made me really happy. Loved seeing Starry Night there and, but it was just a beautiful environment and, um, we were there for a few hours. From there, we went and saw, we actually went up in the Arc de Triomphe and loved doing that. The lines everywhere. Um, Annie, were so short, we just couldn't believe it. Um, <laughs> so we had tickets for everything that we did, but if, if anything, we just had a short line for security. Um, but going up in the top of that was wonderful versus going up in the Eiffel Tower because we could actually see the Eiffel Tower True. in the background. It was a beautiful day. So um, we did that. We did one of the, the Sin cruises during the day. And that was a, a great way to get to see, you know, Notre Dame and some different sites along the water. We enjoyed that. And then that very first... Um, night that we were there, we had our anniversary dinner and we went to, is it Les Ombres? Les Ombres, um, yeah. Yes, yes. And that was, it was a great meal, but it was also a great setting. We were there for several hours. Um, the staff was incredible, but the view of the Eiffel Tower at night, um, they have a roof that you can go out onto and have drinks out there and watching the tower sparkle. And it was just the best view. Yeah. Um, so that was a really, really incredible special occasion meal for sure. Well, that's great for an anniversary. Um, that's lovely. Yeah, it, it worked out perfect. So um, we got to go and we walked through the Tuileries Gardens on our way to the Orangery Museum. And that was one of my favorite museums. Being in the Water Lilies rooms yeah. was incredible and learning about how, how they put together those rooms and that Mo that Monet was a part of designing those rooms was great. What else did we see? We saw the Louvre and went through the Louvre. It was a little bit overwhelming, but not as bad as I thought. I kind of, I'm a planner. So I had a plan of what I, a plan of attack, <laughs> what I wanted to see. And I knew the areas, everything were in. So um, we kind of did those things first and then what time we had left seeing other areas, but so I wanted to make sure. Sorry. Did you end up doing like one museum a day or something like that? 
we did, I think there was one day that we went to two smaller museums, um, but the Louvre was a day all by itself. So we didn't spend a day there, but it was the only museum of that day because we were there for a few hours. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was amazing. Again, n- no, the line was maybe 15 minutes long and it was mostly security. So that was, you know, COVID yeah. has been a terrible thing, but it did definitely make our trip a little bit easier because the lines were so much shorter. Um, and then we also probably both of our least favorite museums. I'm glad we saw it because the building was beautiful, but the Picasso museum ended up, I thought it would be one of my favorites and it ended up being probably our, both of our least favorite. Is that right? Um, okay. It's not it was my a favorite beautiful either. setting. Yeah. I, I, I think they had um, another artist was there and I just, I think I was shocked by how little, how few of his works we ended up seeing um, it felt like, but again, it was in a beautiful building. And since I love design and architecture, um, I'm glad we got to see the building. Yeah. Um, the building is lovely. Yeah. Yes. But we, we enjoyed the other three mu- museums um, quite a bit more. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of great meals and I'm trying to think, Oh, we did Au Chateau wine bar yeah. um, for a tasting that we had reserved. A friend had actually done that a couple of years ago, I think 2019. And that was a lot of fun. So it was, uh, it was a great time and ended up bringing back some wine from that uh, wine and champagne from that visit. And that ended up kind of being our meal that evening too. Um, <laughs> do the wine and the cheese and the bread. And so that was great. And then we did the catacombs what did you think of the catacombs? Just, you know, I, it was a lot more, I, I, I didn't know what to expect. I knew what we were going to be seeing, but I feel like until you're actually there, you don't realize how somber it is. Um, <laughs> there was so much of the history that we read on the walls before actually going in. And it just kind of, it was very quiet. There were a lot of people going through, but my husband and I didn't even talk to each other, just taking it all in. um, It was, it was really an experience and kind of somber. And we were both kind of (laughs) turned off by the end, the gift shop that you go through um, (laughs) kind of had, you know, uh, fun, kitschy yeah. um, skulls and and yeah. almost like Halloween decor. And sure. we were like, no, that is not <laughs> that is not what should be here to commemorate. It's not this, reverent this enough, I guess. Yes. So it felt odd. We both walked out thinking, oh my gosh, that was you know so sad and, and incredible. And uh, but we weren't in the mood to buy any decorative skeletons <laughs> no. at that point. <laughs> Um, we did think it was interesting, though, that they had someone there at the exit to check your belongings again, kind of like when you go through security at the beginning. And I guess that's because people do have in the past actually tried to take out um, yeah. bones with them yeah. and pieces. Uh, and that hadn't even occurred to me. So <laughs> but it, it was I, I, that, I would not have done that. No, um, no, me but neither. it was it was a really I'm glad we did it. It was a really interesting experience. And of course, you had um, booked that in advance. Yes, yes. We we booked everything in advance. I didn't want to leave anything to chance. So I think we got to a lot of places and realized, oh, we probably didn't need to book this in advance. It's not very crowded. Um, but I was glad that we still had done that. Yeah, for although sure. the catacombs, it's usually crowded, especially in the month of October. We're recording in October. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> yes, I bet. I bet. Yeah, it's um, very and cool. then we just we did Montmartre, that area, um, and some shopping, a little bit of shopping on the Champs Elysees. And that kind of rounded out our time in Paris. Mm, wow. Yeah, you saw a lot of you saw a lot of things. And th- would did. you say you had a favorite of all of this? For instance, one of the things you list is Bertillon, the ice cream. Was it yes. that different it, from other ice cream you've had? You know, it was pretty incredible. But I think another reason that we could say we enjoyed it was because there was no line. We got ah, there and yeah. I thought, is this the right place? There was no one else there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I, we may have felt like, oh, was that really worth it? Had we have stood in the line for an hour, but there was right. no line. And we literally walked right up to the counter and talked to the, the ladies working behind the counter and ordered and walked right out. So it was, you know, that was pretty, 
pretty great, um, but it was delicious. Yes, I had chocolate. My husband had some sort of sorbet, and we absolutely loved it. And just eating as we walked around that area. I think pay- favorites for Paris would definitely, you know, going up in the Eiffel Tower was kind of a, having done that for the first time, that had always been a dream. So that was pretty incredible. We loved the Louvre and we loved the Orangery. As far as meals, we loved the ice cream. <laughs> um, we did Little Braza, the creperie, and that was delicious. Yeah. Um, let's see. One of our, we had a kind of like a brunch in Montmartre at the Hardware Society. Ah. Um, that was delicious. And the uh, more of a casual meal outside in a traditional cafe setting at Les Ant- Antiquaires. Les Antiquaires, yeah. Say that? Yes, yes. That was super fun. And our waiter there was great. So that made that experience even more fun. And the food yeah, was they hem it so. up at the end. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, and we found everyone was just a lot of people asked us, you know, were they rude? What was it like? What was your service like? Everyone, especially at restaurants, was incredibly kind to us. We didn't yeah. encounter any rude service. You know, of course, I was making sure I was greeting everyone, bonjour, and and using my manners, but everyone was very over, almost overly friendly, joked with us and engaged in a lot of chit chat with us. And I think it felt to both of us like they were very excited to have tourism back. Now you mentioned the um, Rue Crémieux. I don't think I've ever been to Rue Crémieux. What is it like? Say that again. Rue to where? Crémieux, C-R-E-M-I-E-U-X. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, it was actually just in all of my research. I did a lot of research over the last year on Pinterest, and I oh, is that the one I, with all it, the colors? Y- yes, it's oh. all of the the houses, almost like row houses. Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah, sure yeah, what yeah, they yeah. actually call them. Yeah, it looks and like they're London. very very colorful. Yes. Um, so each house is a different color, and it was just a really cute street. Uh, we Unfortunately, we were there. There were a couple of different photographers there doing actual photo shoots down the street. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so, but it was it's private residences. So we just walked down that street on our way to somewhere else. And it was really, really cute street. Lots of unique, colorful houses. What did but, you think of the bouquinist? You mentioned that you went to the bouquinist on oh, the Seine yes. River. Oh, yes. It was fun. My husband could have looked through those materials for hours. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> we we had maybe an hour total to stop and look at, and look at those along the Seine. But he was just um, enthralled with all of the magazines. And I flipped through the art, but he really flipped through the magazines and the books and It was, it was, yeah, I'd read about them, but um, it was a very neat setup that they have there. Uh, and I read that it's really hard to get a spot and that a lot of the people that have had yeah. those spots have had them for decades. Um, oh, yeah. So, but he, that was definitely a favorite for him. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. So for me, uh, I don't really see the point, but a lot of people like to just the discovery, the, you know. Yes. Finding yes. the precious one old thing. Yes, yes. Um, and and honestly, just being near the Sen in general, we both just really enjoyed going to a couple of different nights. We went and walked the Sen at night, going to the Louvre at night um, and sitting out, which obviously we weren't the only ones doing that. that we were in good company, but it was just a beautiful, a beautiful area and nice to just sit by the water and everything is just so lit up at and very buzzing in the evening. We enjoyed that a lot. So, so I wanted to ask you if anything felt really tourist to you, but of course this summer, was there anything that was packed with tourists? Maybe not. You know, by the time we left the Louvre, we got to the Louvre when it op- just before it opened um, and we had tickets and our line was short. By the time we left, it felt much more It was definitely much more busy. It was just, uh, you know, lunchtime and it it had become a lot more crowded. But outside of that, even the Eiffel Tower, the day that we went up in the Eiffel Tower was the first day that it opened. So it had reopened and we were there on that very first day and had tickets. But even it didn't feel real crowded and touristy. I think maybe I wondered if a lot of people didn't realize 
that it had reopened that yeah. first day. I don't know, but it, it didn't even feel that way. Um, so I think just timing wise with everything with COVID and everything just starting to open back up when right before we went, it kept it from feeling too busy. And a lot of times we felt like as we were walking and going into different shops and like we were the only ones there. Mm -hmm. How does it feel? How did it feel COVID wide? Like, did it feel uncomfortable, scary? No, normal? no. Um, you know, everyone wore their masks, especially in all of the museums and inside of the restaurants. It was, we were there, I think a few weeks prior to the health pass going into effect. So But everyone was very compliant with that. A lot of people even wore them outside. Uh, but it, it, everything felt very clean. Everything felt like, you know, no stone un had been left unturned. They, they were prepared for that. Um, and I never saw anyone not wanting to wear their mask indoors, you know, catacombs, museums, anywhere. It was just um, I never felt unsafe, I guess, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for some a lot of our meals we ate outside, which right. was nice and, and not having to worry about that. But even when we wait, when we ate inside, it was not a problem. Yeah. And so then you headed down south and you went to all these places. So I don't know if we'll so many talk times. about all of them. You went to Avignon. No, so Did many. you actually look at Avignon or just you? No, we okay. didn't stop. I mean, we saw a lot as we were driving. Right. Um, And, and I wish that we would have planned, a, you know, half a day there to stop and look, but um, we didn't actually do, do anything mm -hmm. there, um, just driving out. Gosh, and you we missed so Perne les Fontaines, which I yes. don't think I've been to. What is that like? Yes. Well, I, it was not initially on my list. Um, someone I followed on social media had stopped there and went to a... Um, home decor concept store that just looked incredible. And I thought, oh, gosh, that's 15 minutes from Isle sur la Sorgue, um, which was on our plan. And I thought we just need a detour so I can stop in that, yeah. that home shop. It was incredible. Two stories, very large. The woman that owned it was very friendly and wonderful. And um, I ended up bringing back one of my favorite souvenirs, a big wooden teak bowl um, mm. that I crammed into my carry-on <laughs> um, <laughs> from there. But the town was very, very small. Okay. I, I would have not known about it had I not seen that shop on social So you went on through that media. one shop called La Maison Pernoise that mm -hmm. I've never heard yes. of either. So. Yes, it very was beautiful. Small. All all home interiors, which is right up my alley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it was very close to um, Isle sur le Sorgue. Um, so it wasn't very far out of our way to, right. to check that out. So we did that. We did. We wanted to see the the source of the river Sorg. So we ah. did Fontaine, Fontaine Vaucluse. Vaucluse yeah. um, we and it was it was um, there wasn't a lot of water there. There were a lot of people <laughs> there to see it, um, but it was pretty dry <laughs> in July. Well, that's funny. Um, but the, the town was very cute. Um, so and then from there we did. Um, oozes, um, oozes got, yes. yes, and got to see, um, Pont du Gard and my husband loved that. I mean, we both loved that. It was incredible, but I hadn't, he loves history and I hadn't told him about that stopping to see that. So, oh, yeah. um, he was surprised. That was kind of a treat for him for putting up with all the museums <laughs> in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> we, one of my favorite things was definitely Gord. We were there on market day. So that was a, a really fun experience for me. We bought a lot of souvenirs for our parents who were taking care of our children nice. <laughs> um, there and some things for ourselves. So being there on market day was great. And we had breakfast. One of our favorite meals was breakfast at Bastide de Gord with an incredible view outside on the terrace. So that was great. Um, I think for both of us, one of the highlights of our trip overall, not just of Provence was the town of Moustier St. Marie, mm -hmm. that's how you say it. And we right out, we spent some time there and ate, had a lunch there, but we also did the pedal boating in right outside of there in the Verdon Gorge. And that oh, was nice. really incredible. Like kind of a, felt like a bucket list thing for sure. Yeah. And that was from Moustier. 
Yes. Oh, yes. nice. Nice. So that was wonderful. Um, and then we saw um, Roussillon. Roussillon, yeah. And did that. We walk, hiked the, the shorter trail there. Just incredible how everything was. Even the buildings were all orange, shades of oranges and pinks <laughs> and really beautiful village. We did Banyu and we actually did a wine tasting right outside of Banyu. That was a lot of fun and, and brought some wine back from that as well. <laughs> now, when you say you brought some wine back, did you, do you mean back to the U.S. or you just bought some to drink at your hotel? No, back to the U.S. Ooh, I had nice. purchased on Amazon. I'd read about they're kind of like bubble wrap. Um, they, they are bubble wrap in the shape of wine bottles. And ah, yes, and there's like three or four layers of bubble wrap and all four bottles that we purchased um, from the champagne down to the rosé all fit inside. And then you kind of they have Velcro at the bottom and you kind of pull them up and that's meant to protect them enough. But I still once they were in our suitcases, <laughs> wrapped them in some clothes yeah. um, for extra protection. We didn't buy enough to, you know, have them shipped back in a box or anything like that. We sure. just um, had a few bottles, but everything made it back safe. So I would highly recommend those. <laughs> they were That's pretty, good. I think it was, you know, four pack for $12 maybe. Um, so I'll link them that was, in the show notes for people. Yes, to that was, at. that was great. And we saw, um, we went real quickly through Minerb, Min- Minerbs, which I think had become famous by Peter Mail. Right. And that was a really cute, cute town too. So Hmm. But definitely a highlight for us was the pedal boating on the Verdon Gorge. Oh, I that's would recommend great. That to and I everyone. had not heard that you could do that from Moustier Sainte Marie. So that's great. Well, to know. and we, it was right. It was right outside of Moustier Sainte Marie. Ah, okay. Um, so a little bit of a drive. We parked um, near the bridge, and that was probably honestly standing in line. You can't purchase tickets to do that in advance. Right. So standing in line to get on. Um, the water was probably the longest line we stood of in all of France. It was probably over an hour. <laughs> and it was probably it was full of French people because that's a really yes. popular thing for locals. Yes, but it was incredible. Very glad that we made the time to do that. And then you went to the Riviera, so on the water. Yes. So you went to Cassis. Yes, yes, we did. We let's see, we did Cassis, we did Grimaud, which was a pretty small village. Saw the castle ruins there. We yeah, Grimaud did... is really popular with French people. Okay, okay, uh, it didn't feel very touristy. No, <laughs> um, so that makes sense. No. That makes sense. I have very good friend, a very good friend who's been going there since she was like a tiny kid. And, uh, okay, very popular. It was beautiful. Yeah, we did Saint Tropez which wasn't really high on my list. I'm not really one for the glitz and glam, but I thought, okay, if we have time, we'll stop. (laughs) Who knows when we'll be back and and we can say we saw it. So we did walk the harbor and see all of the yachts and, but it was probably a little more fancy and, and touristy than what we were interested in. We definitely preferred the smaller villages. Uh Um, and yeah. then we stayed, we did Antibes, and we stayed in an Airbnb for two nights in a small town right outside, you know, 12 minutes outside of Antibes. Um, so we spent a lot of time there. One of our favorite meals actually was there. We did a really small kind of alleyway restaurant called La Petite Escale, owned by a husband and wife. And the husband is the chef, and the wife pretty much does everything else, and it was incredible. I wish we would have eaten there both nights. Um, They were just a really lovely couple. And she, it wasn't just us, she chatted up with every table and um, talked about um, their history of what brought them there and starting their restaurant. And it was very reasonably priced and the food was incredible. So that was one of our favorite meals of the entire trip. And then you did the Sentier du Littoral, which is really fun. Tell yes, us about yes. That. It was again, we I think we started out pretty early that day and we were the only ones. There was one other couple that was very fit and looked like maybe they were French and they they walk that frequently. Um, and they set out and took off ahead of us. Um, mm-hmm. And we never saw them again. <laughs> but for a very long time, it felt like we were the only ones on on that trail. It was beautiful. So this um, is a trail along, that goes along, along the, the 
along the the water and it's kind yes. of rocky yes. and yes and there, i mean you and can't actually, go like with, a, you said with that. a stroller and whatever no, you know yeah. no there the beginning of it was more um well formed with the stones but i'm glad you you said that because we were both very glad that we had um tennis shoes on yeah. i had a dress on but i had tennis shoes on and and it became very uneven and rocky yeah. and um, you could lose your footing very easily, but it was a gorgeous view of the water. And we didn't do the whole whole trail. We turned around at some point. Right. Um, it, could, it could take but, uh, two hours to do the whole thing, maybe. Yes. Uh, yes. One way, you know. And then it's not lit either, so you have to know that if you, uh, you know, if you're planning on going out and coming back, and it's going to be dark. Um, don't do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We were there bright and early in the morning. That, right, that's good right. to know. Um, no. And then from there we did Ease, which was definitely one of my favorite yeah, um, lovely, yeah. places that we've, we visited. And we did the exotic garden there and did a little bit of shopping and stopped and watched musicians playing outside. And it was a really cute, neat village. And then I wasn't sure if we would have time to visit we did St. Jean Cat Ferret, Ferret mm-hmm. and visited the Villa Efruzzi, yeah. um, the Rothschild. That was actually, that was the very end of our trip. And that was actually the f- first time and only time outside of the airport that we were asked to show a no- negative COVID test results. Mm, okay. Um, so that kind of caught us off guard. <laughs> yeah. We had them, but um, right. caught us off guard. And that that was a really beautiful, really beautiful. I wish we would have had more time to explore the gardens there. Um, we went through the tour inside and and then wandered around out in the gardens for a while. Yeah, honestly, I mean, you did this in eleven days. You could have spent eleven days in Paris and eleven days in exactly. Provence, you know, exactly. And it would have been very comfortable doing it that way. You kind of went fast for we but, did, but you know, we, did. we thought you, you warned me that you packed a lot in. <laughs> yes, yes, and and that and that's kind of our typical way of doing things, to, regardless of where we are. But especially coming there, I just I wasn't sure when we would get back, and there's so much that I wanted to see. So right. we definitely we we squeezed a lot in, and then we kind of ended our trip. I think the last town we went to was Saint Paul de Vence, which was actually where we were going to stay initially and that was the Airbnb that was no longer available ah. when we had to move our trip to July. Yeah. So it was great to see where we were going to stay and see the town. It was a really beautiful town, a pedestrian town for sure. So that was nice that we weren't um, in danger of being run over by any of the motorbikes or <laughs> <laughs> uh, walking down the streets. Um, yeah was that was a beautiful town so as you well. have one thing that you, that didn't go so well that you wouldn't do again tell us about that yes oh and i hesitate to say this i know a lot of people love michelin star restaurants and maybe it was just the restaurant that we chose i'm not sure but it just overall was not the best experience we were the youngest people there by far everyone looked at us as if we were very out of place. So it felt a little uncomfortable. Mm. Um, The food was just very, I'm all for trying new things. And we tried a lot of things, monkfish, I mean, all different kinds of fish and things that I've never had here in the States. But the food was just very, very interesting. (laughs) We both (laughs) left, even though it was, you know, ended up being a six or seven course meal, we both left feeling kind of hungry still. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, portions. Those, and my huh? husband, will, my husband will eat anything, but very small portions, very, I, I swear I ate a jellyfish. They did not call it that. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was what it looked like. So it was just, it was, we felt, so which we were, one the was view, it? the view was in, the view was incredible. The view was incredible. I wish we yeah. could have just gone and had drinks there, yeah. um, which I'm not sure if they offer that or not, but mm. it just ended up feeling like an overpriced disappointment. And after our meal and it was in Antibes. So after our meal at La Petite Escale, we thought, oh gosh, we should have just gone there again. That yeah. meal was incredible. <laughs> the couple that owned it was incredible. We, you know, it was under a hundred euros, I think. And we had um, rosé even. It was, and then to go 
to that, we both wish we would have just gone to the other place. <laughs> so what was the name of that restaurant, the Michelin star that you don't recommend? <laughs> Come on. It was, it was, it was in the Bell Bell. It was Bell Reeve in okay. the hotel. And I think they have a couple of different restaurants within the hotel, Yeah, but it was definitely, it was, uh, the presentation was amazing. And they right. tell you all about everything and why chef chose what chef chose. But we also <laughs> kind of felt duped into purchasing part of the meal. Um, oh, you know what else really kind of upset me? The, the, which maybe I should have known this in advance, but this didn't happen anywhere else. My menu and my husband's menus were different menus. Oh, he and had we the didn't prices. know that in, until after the fact, but the prices weren't on my menu. And they were on his menu. Yeah. <laughs> so I ordered having no idea. Yes. And that was just, I don't know if I would say I'm a feminist, but that was just kind of a turnoff for me. <laughs> it definitely is a turnoff. Now, I have to admit, I have never been to a Michelin star restaurant where I thought, oh, this is so amazing. I loved it. You know, some of them I'm like, oh, this wasn't bad. But my okay. my usual experience is it's often overpriced. So I think people go to Michelin star restaurants because they feel very special about themselves and they want to be among people who feel special about themselves. <laughs> it, it very much felt that way, um, right. especially one particular table that was next to us. It, it very much felt that way. I, I didn't, when I chose it, I actually chose it for the location. It was going to be our last night, our last dinner in France. And it just had this beautiful location over the water. And then when I read more about it, I realized it had a Michelin star and I thought, oh, well, we've never done that before, you know, yeah, um, and the yeah. menu changes. So what we saw, what I saw online initially wasn't what they were offering when we were there, but, um, it definitely, I think was overpriced. And I think Maybe it sounds like from what you've experienced, the experience of a Michelin star restaurant is overhyped in general. So yeah, unless I, you are a really a, a foodie and um, don't mind throwing away, you know, that kind of money. It just was, I we felt like yeah. we could have done the other restaurant a I, second night in a row. And you know, I happy. was raised with just no nonsense type of Thing. A lot of what happens in these upper scale restaurants feels like nonsense to me, but that's just my yes. personality. You know, I'm, I'm sure that I've had such a wonderful time in restaurants where it's like you said, you know, for, for two people, wonderful wine, full, full meal, dessert, appetizer, the whole lot. And it's, it's a hundred euros for two people and it's a marvelous yes. meal. It's a wonderful time. And then you go to the uppity restaurants, some of them, not all of them, you know, right. where you're like, I feel comfortable, I'm, yes. I'm underdressed or... I almost said uppity and I thought, I wonder if she would know what I meant by that word. <laughs> so yes, it definitely felt you know, that way. Or, or maybe, uh, am I talking too loud? And you know, Right. Anyway, so it's just not my, my, my not my jam. Yes, okay. we felt the same. <laughs> We felt the same for sure. <laughs> and then the other thing, we have to cut it short. We have to stop because we've talked so long. But the other thing you say is what you wish you had known is that the Tour de France was coming through on the last day in Paris and that it was gridlock. Yes. When the Tour yes. de France goes by, it's gridlock anywhere. Yes. Paris, anywhere in France. They just shut every all the streets, all the access, and uh, don't plan on going anywhere. And also, uh, when the ma a marathon comes through, it's the same experience. Uh, they just okay. lock it down. And um... Okay, tell us about your general tips and advice. I want to hear about that. I, you know, for Paris, I was glad that we had really, I'd researched the neighborhood that we stayed in. I was really glad that we had tickets for everything in advance and that we visited the Louvre first thing in the morning. I, I knew what neighborhoods we would be in and where I would like to eat. And even if it wasn't someplace we could have reservations, it, I think it paid to plan in advance and know where you wanted to be for your meals. I, I th we didn't have a problem spending on Ubers or taxis, even when it was someplace close enough that we could walk because we knew that that would get us there quicker um, and that our time was limited. Yeah. Um, so we were very open to that. And we just I very much planned our days around what neighborhoods we were going to be in while we were 
uh, each day was kind of a different area. And that helped a lot. Yeah, it's um, true. It's not for, something we've mentioned a lot on the podcast. But if you call an Uber, you don't have to worry about how to get there. The driver's <laughs> problem. Right. And, and it, it allowed us to cram more in. Exactly. For sure. <laughs> exactly. It goes a lot faster because a metro system is kind of complicated. If you're only there for right. a few days, maybe it's not worth your time, you know, learning right. the metro system. Because when you um, learn something, you'll make mistakes, obviously. Exactly. Exactly. And then as far as Provence, I think I already mentioned, you know, making sure that we learned quickly that when we were using GPS to have our navigation take us to the parking area um, mm. for the town. And, and otherwise it would pull us to the center of town, which wasn't always someplace that was drivable to get to, to begin with. Yeah. So Especially doing Provence. That, Provence, the houses, yes. because house prices are very high in Provence. And so okay. they cram a lot in like, uh, whenever I go to Provence compared to the Southwest, you know, it's just, I mean, Southeast versus Southwest. So yes. the temperature is the same. A lot is the same. A lot of the food is the same, etc. What's different is Provence, they cram it all in and it's really narrow. Everything is narrow and tight. And, right. And you don't yes. want to be driving those streets if you, you know, if they tell you to, to park at the entrance of the village, you better do that. It's yes, a good thing exactly. to do that. Instead of, and look for the little payant machine. Yeah. Um, and that is a great way to do it. And yeah. I was really glad that we got to be there for one of their big market days. So I would definitely plan around that and make sure that you were in a in a town on their market day. That was a great experience. And um, I was glad, really grateful in Provence for my travel charger <laughs> um, oh, as well. Yeah. Um, our car didn't have GPS, so um, you I was the, using the phone my phone the yeah. quite a bit. Yes. And that burns up a lot of battery. Um, oh, and yeah. then just the Riviera, I was really grateful to, I'm glad I experienced the Michelin star. Now I know what it's about and I don't feel the need to do that again, but, um, <laughs> I was also really grateful. And I think I already shared with you on the Facebook group, but to, to find the shuttle and ease, um, that got us from the parking lot um, down to the town was a great, great thing. It even came with a pass to um, the exotic gardens. But right, that was super, so I ha- I, I researched that, and I will try and find out. I don't remember where I put it, but I'll. I remember researching that and finding the details, and I'll put that in the show notes if I yes, find it was, again. I think it was six euros, and they have a bus cut that comes every like 10 minutes it's it's frequent 10 or 15 minutes yeah. and take you up and down yeah, because, and so uh, it parking was at super is, helpful yeah. yes parking at is, is no bueno <laughs> yes <laughs> that was a great discovery wonderful well thank you so much that was Brienne that was wonderful it was really interesting and for your first time in France you really saw a lot <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I hope to be back. I would love to especially take my daughter um, to visit Paris. But there's still some regions of the country, um, you know, Normandy and that we didn't uh, that weren't a part of this trip. So right. I would love to come back and do Paris and a couple of other areas. Maybe. And one of these days you'll do a restful anniversary trip. How about that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> my husband would love that. But that's just not my style, Amy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brianne, and thank you for talking to me. Thank you for having me. Au revoir. Au revoir. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us. Thank you all for supporting the show. Some of you for a long time. You are wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Don Anderson, Kate W., Jude Espiritu, and Christina Stanley. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. Bonjour, Elise. Bonjour, Annie. How's your Patreon going? Well, my Patreon is going okay. I think everyone out there knows, or I hope they do, that I did have to take a kind of break. I took a hiatus from it because I was... I had to go through a convalescence after some surgery. So uh, that convalescence is coming to an end, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. And a new episode should be coming out soon. I can't say exactly which day, but definitely in the near, near future. And I know what it's going to be. And in the meantime, I would just like to give a very, very nice thank you to Rhonda, who is from Alberta, Canada. 
mm-hmm. and who sent me a lovely message saying how much she liked the way I talked about art, which always makes me very, very happy. Well deserved. Well, yes. And of course, you know, it is, of course, one of my favorite subjects. And it brings us up to uh, another episode we're going to do soon. That's going to be about a different kind of art. So stay tuned, everybody. To become one of Elise's patrons, go to patreon.com forward slash Elise Art, E-L-Y-S-A-R-T. And thank you very much. Thank you, Annie. And another way to support this podcast is to hire me to be your itinerary consultant. Here's how it works. You purchase the service on joinusinfrance.com and then you go look for the boutique tab. Then you tell me what you have in mind. I write up what I think would be best for your case. And uh, voila, you're ready for your trip to France. Now, because this service is so popular, uh, I'm having to turn it off for a while so I can take a winter break, but it'll be back. You can still book an itinerary review until the 25th of November, and then I'll be back doing those in January. A shout out and my thank yous also to Steve Weaver and his wife, Diane. We spent a lovely afternoon together last Saturday. They invited us to lunch. They were coming through in Toulouse and invited us to lunch, my husband and I, and we had a lovely time. Uh, Thank you very much. And he also made some recommendations of other places I need to check out in France. It will never end. So Linda emailed me to say that her husband, she and her husband, were in the Carrefour in Cap d'Ail, uh, that's in uh, Provence. Uh, the cashier spoke no English and she speaks college French. My poor husband doesn't speak French at all. I asked her if she spoke English and she said no. So I spoke in French to her and the best I could. My husband tried to speak French too, very badly. (laughs) The cashier's face just lit up when he spoke and I explained he didn't know the language. (laughs) She acted as we had just given her the winning lottery ticket. It shows that in any country, if you try to speak the language, even if you butcher it, Merci for an amazing podcast. Makes me yearn to return to France. Yes, this is really important. French people are very self-conscious about their English. And so if you try French and if you butcher it because you don't know it very well, they will be very happy that (laughs) you're trying and they will also try their bad English on you. So don't be stressed about whether your French is good enough. What's good enough is when you try and when you're polite and uh, when you treat people with kindness and respect. And it's a fact that, especially in places that are not very popular with uh, American visitors, Cap I mean, it's a a popular resort place, but maybe they don't see American visitors every day at that Carrefour. (laughs) You know, don't expect people will all speak English. Just try your French and do the best you can. So for the French expression of the week, je donne ma langue au chat. (laughs) Je donne ma langue au chat. If you translate it literally, it means I give my tongue to the cat. Yes, we do (laughs) that in French, but of course we don't. (laughs) Strangely, what this means in French is I give up trying. So somebody makes you guess something and you say, je donne ma langue au chat. That means I I don't know. Tell me. (laughs) I give up trying. There you go. Je donne ma langue au chat. And whatever you do, do not feed human tongue to cats. COVID numbers in France are kind of uh, staying steady. Um, You know, it's it's not ideal, but it's not terrible. (laughs) COVID uh, tests are not free for most people anymore in France. And so the number of people who are actually taking these tests are is going down. So it's hard to tell what's happening now going forward. I mean, if people go to their doctor and say, I have symptoms, then they will be prescribed a test and that will be free. But you can't just walk into a pharmacy and ask for a free test, which was the case up until recently in France. So it's really hard to convince people to get vaccinated. And the third doses are going on, but even there, there's a bunch of people who are just hesitant to go get their third dose, whatever. As soon as it's my turn, I'll go do it. So 
But I bet if uh, the numbers suddenly spike, then a lot of people will uh, go for the shot. I'd rather not have a spike. <laughs> so, so, you know, hopefully it'll keep uh, going that way. My husband and I are off to Périgueux in Dordogne. Périgueux has a beautiful cathedral, a lovely museum. We picked a beautiful bed and breakfast uh, where we'll be staying and we'll try some restaurants and that. So it'll be very fun. And on the way back, we'll stop in another beautiful village called Saint-Cyprien. I've seen photos. It looks gorgeous. And we'll also stop uh, at the Château des Milandres um, where Josephine Baker lived because I've been there before, but I don't have photos. Because when I went previously, all I had was my big old camera. And there used to be signs that said no photos. So I couldn't take any photos. I mean, because, you know, big old camera, that's not like, c'est pas discret. Hein? C'est, <laughs> it's like, I stuck out with my big camera. I had to put it away. But with a phone, I might be able to take a few photos this time. We'll see. Anyway. <laughs> I might be breaking the rules, but I'm going to publish an episode about Josephine Baker. To have an episode about her, I need some photos, right? Nah, it's for a good cause. If you enjoy the show, introduce a friend to the podcast and tell them why you listen. We're everywhere. Uh, remember the new uh, way to share the podcast with your Facebook friends. Uh, from the Facebook mobile app from your phone, search for Join Us in France, the page, then tap on the podcast tab and uh, pick the one you want to share. And uh, there you go. Oh, and last week there was a problem with the audio uh, briefly. I made a bonehead mistake. I had uh, muted some of the tracks. And so when I export the audio, it did not, it exported empty, no sound. So for like two thirds of the episode, there was nothing. And uh, I fixed it within an hour, but I also then created two episodes. So last week's episode 360, it's kind of odd. Uh, Yeah, but (laughs) it, it rarely happens these days, but I still can make a bonehead mistake like that. And this happens because this is truly an indie podcast. I do everything myself. I don't have researchers. Well, actually, I do. Elise is a researcher. And you, my guests on the episodes, are the researchers. Uh, but, you know, it, otherwise, all the technical stuff I do by myself. So uh, that's, that's why once in a while I make a dumb mistake. Next week on the podcast, an episode about... A gentleman who walked in the footsteps of his grandfather's soldier. His grandfather was a soldier in World War I France. Excellent conversation because, of course, next week we will celebrate the end of the First World War. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2021 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.